This is Drosophila melanogaster. Aren't they beautiful? I can see uh, some skepticism. Well, maybe it takes a mother's compound eye. But these animals really are spectacular. And uh, to help get us started on to why I think these animals are so cool, I want to do a, a simple control problem for you. I'm going to try to balance this meter stick on the tip of my finger. Now, the idea is that the meter stick is going to rotate, and my hand needs to adjust itself fast enough so that I can catch it before it falls. Now, this is a problem that most of us can do. But once we start shortening the meter stick, like, for example, if I tried to balance a pen on my finger, then we're already doing something that's pretty much impossible for most humans to do. And the reason is that the time that it takes for the pen to rotate shrinks with the size of the object. So by the time I get to something that's 10 times smaller than the meter stick, oops, yeah, this thing, it's just really hard to do. Now, insects like Drosophila are inherently unstable. Their flapping flight is subject to aerodynamic instabilities. And the time scale for these instabilities is also related to their height. And because Drosophila are only a millimeter tall, they have to perform this kind of balancing act 100 times faster than what it would take for me to balance this pen. Pretty amazing. In my lab, we take movies of these animals performing uh, their flight. And then what we do is we reconstruct their three-dimensional motions from the images that we capture. And the first thing that I want you to notice is these are beautiful. These insects are moving their wings in a figure eight wing stroke back and forth. And my students get to take a look at this every day when they go into the lab. <laughs> so by being able to capture these maneuvers, we're able to say something about how these insects are controlling the aerodynamic forces that get them to do the things that they do. So for example, we could start to test some of the basic ideas that people had put forward. So for example, if you take nature's flyers and open it up, you see that the way that insects are supposed to produce a forward thrust is by taking their wing stroke, tilting it so that some of the lift forces that they're using to keep them aloft are redirected in the forward direction. But when we took a look at our Drosophila, we saw that, yeah, they're doing this some of the time, but a lot of the time they're doing something more like this, where they're keeping their wing strokes totally horizontal, and yet they're still able to produce a forward thrust. What's going on? Well, if you take a look at a fly that's hovering versus a fly that's moving fast, both of those wing strokes look pretty much the same. They have this figure eight wing shape. And when you start to look at the very details of these wing strokes, you see that there are slight differences, but they're kind of subtle. So for example, the top curve shows you the stroke of the fly. It goes from 0 to 180 as the wing moves back and forth. The middle curve has the uh, deviation angle of the wing. And it goes up in the front and up in the back. And that's why it has two peaks, one in the front and one in the middle. And then the last curve is telling you about the pitch of the wing. And this pitch goes from 0 to 180 degrees. And what it says is that the fly is moving forward with an angle of 45 degrees. Then it flips its wing and moves back at an angle of 135. And in each of these cases, there are subtle differences between the blue and the red curves corresponding to the hovering fly and the fast-moving fly. Which of these differences is important? Well, to try to answer that, we ran a bunch of simulations. And what's nice is that if you run all of the red curves, the fast-moving fly wing strokes on the simulation, you can get a fly that moves forward. But the beautiful thing about simulations is that now we can mix and match. So for example, if we take all of the blue curves from the hovering fly, we can generate a fly that, like the experiment, moves very, very slowly. On the other hand, if we take all the red curves, we can generate a fly that moves quickly. By mixing and matching, I can start to tell which ones of these are important. So for example, in the very left here, I'm showing you a fly where we took the stroke curve from the hovering fly the deviation curve from the fast-moving fly, and the pitch curve from the slow-moving fly. Red, sorry, blue, red, and blue. And that fly is moving 
at exactly the same velocity as though it were just hovering. So that red curve did nothing to give it that forward thrust. On the other hand, as long as we took the, the pitch curve from the fast moving fly, all of those ended up moving fast in the forward direction. In fact, you can take all of the curves from the slow moving fly, and as long as you change the pitch, reduce it uniformly, you can generate a fast moving fly. What's going on? What's happening with this pitch? Well, remember, pitch is the uh, orientation of the wing. It's kind of like the angle of attack. And if I take this symmetric wing stroke and I uniformly change the pitch so that it's lower, then the fly ends up slicing through the air on the way forward and smashing on the air on the way back. And so it's effectively swimming through the air. These flies are not just using their lift forces, they're using their drag forces to swim themselves forward. But once you have forward flight, now you know how to turn, right? Because turning is just forward flight with one wing and then moving backwards with the other. You can actually demonstrate this. Um, so lucky for you, I brought my, my wings with me. So here I have my wings. I, I even uh, painted them appropriately. <laughs> and what I, what I have here is a, um, it's a frictionless swivel platform. And if, as long as I don't kill myself getting on top of it. OK, there we go. All right, now, if I take my wings and I flap symmetrically, nothing happens. Although you can feel the air all the way down there, right? OK. Um, but now if I slice through the air with this wing and smash with that one, then I can get myself to turn to the left. And if I do it the other way, it takes some practice, <laughs> then I can rotate the other way. Thank you. Woo! Now, why use drag forces? It turns out that, as anyone who's stuck their hand out of a moving car knows, the lift force, the amount of force in the perpendicular direction to your velocity, has a maximum when your hand is just at 45 degrees. Right? So it's zero, zero here, maximum, and then it goes back to zero. But the drag forces increase linearly as you go through. They're always increasing. That means that if I keep my hand at 45 degrees, and I just change it a little bit, that doesn't do very much to the lift force. It keeps it basically the same. But the drag forces change a lot. And so these insects, by applying very subtle manipulations to their wing strokes, are able to manipulate their drag forces and not affect the lift forces that are keeping them up. And that's just a beautiful strategy. Now this idea of differential drag has a long and distinguished history. So the Wright brothers dealt with this problem. Now everybody knows that the Wright brothers did not invent the first airplane. There are many people flying uh, before, the air, before the Wright brothers. No, what the Wright brothers did was they invented the first controllable airplane. <laughs> what was the problem? Well, airplanes are not like cars. You can't just use the rudder to steer them. Airplanes are subject to roll instabilities. And the way that pilots used to deal with this was that they, they would sit in the middle, and when the airplane would start to roll to the right, the pilot would move a little bit to the left. And when the airplane would start to roll to the left, the pilot would move a little bit to the right. And as you can imagine, this was a very bad strategy. And lots of people died using this approach. Um, no, what the Wright brothers did was they noticed that if they warp the wings of the airplane, they can change the angles of attack, and that would allow them to correct for these roll uh, uh, instabilities. So when the airplane rolls to the right, you change the angle of attack on the right side, that creates bigger lift, but it also creates drag. That was the problem. And so what they did was they kludged it. They connected this wing warping to a rudder that allowed the airplane to maintain its yaw, its heading. Now the Wright brothers were superb engineers. They got propeller shapes to something like 90% of their modern day efficiencies. So I think that they would have been really impressed by the fact that insects have figured out a much more clever and elegant solution to using differential drag. Okay, 
controlling these airplanes was Wilbur Wright. What's controlling the flight of these insects? How are they deciding what to do at any particular moment? To try and address this problem, I had a really creative student, and uh, he noticed that if you take one of these brushes from the Gordon Brush Company, and you, you take a clipping of one of those bristles, those clippings end up being magnetic. And so he took that little clipping and he glued it to the back of the fly. You see the fly is still flapping its wings, no problem. And then he puts it into our apparatus. We have our three video cameras recording the fly in fast motion. We then have a laser trigger that tells the cameras when to record. But when the fly is there, we also trigger a pair of electromagnets. So the experiment is the following. The fly comes in. We trigger the cameras to record. We simultaneously apply a magnetic field. The magnet on the fly's back starts to rotate to align with the magnetic field. And that gives the fly a mid-air perturbation. And then we see what happens. This is the first video that we took with this. You can see the needle just poking out the fly's back. Right around here, we apply a magnetic pulse for just one wing beat. And then the insect does what it does. And the amazing thing about this movie is that if you take a look at the orientation of the insect before and after, it's nearly exactly the same. These flies have an autopilot on board that's allowing them to correct for mid-air disturbances. Here's a 3D version of a fly undergoing a, a pitch perturbation. In this case, what the fly does is it changes how far forward it sweeps its wings. If the fly is pitched forward, it has to flap its wings more in the front. That creates a torque from the lift forces that rotates it back. If the fly is pitched up, it just sweeps the wings less far forward, and the torque from the back part rotates it forward. And they constantly do this in order to maintain their flight. Now, the real question is, what's the recipe? How do they know exactly when to put their wings and exactly how far forward to put them? This is a plot of the forward sweep angle as a function of time. And what we've done is we've measured the wing position at the very front at each and every wing stroke. Where does it get this recipe? So I don't want to take you through all of the control theory that we had to do to understand these problems. But I want to point out the following for you. If I take the velocity, the pitch velocity of the fly's body, there it is. And if I now add to it the total angle that the fly has rotated through, that's this curve. If I put those two curves together and sum them up, I get this blue curve, which goes right through the data. So what I'm telling you is that the flies are measuring their pitch velocity. They're integrating that in order to get the total angular displacement that they've moved through, so they know calculus. And then they sum those two signals with appropriate coefficients and send them into the little steering muscles that are guiding their wings to do the forward correction of the stroke. Amazing. This also works for roll and for yaw. In roll, we glue the magnets sideways and we tilt the insects, and they have to flap harder with the lower wing. For yaw, they have to do something like what I showed you on that little pedestal. You have to change the angles of attack in order to reorient themselves. In all of these cases, these, these flies are using something called a proportional integral controller. And by affecting different degrees of freedom, they're able to essentially correct their posture within milliseconds. These are some of the fastest responses in the animal kingdom. This is the kind of circuit that a control theorist would draw for a PI controller. The idea is that you start with torques in the upper left. And then those torques have to be measured by the fly's gyroscopic system called the Hall tiers. Yeah, they have gyroscopes on their back. With a little bit of neural delay, they then have to calculate the proportional term and the integral of that, the integral term. That somehow gets sent into the steering muscles, which then affect the torque, and the cycle continues. And this type of controller is what you'd have in a sophisticated cruise control in your car or a thermometer that you might be setting to set the temperature in a room. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
These are very contrived experiments. Flies in nature don't really have magnets glued to their back. Itai, is eliciting a fast control response really biologically relevant? Well, to help answer that question, I want to show you this video. <laughs> so this is uh, a video. Of, well, stay, stay with me. I know we're in upstate New York, but, but stay with me. This is a video of someone shooting a donut. But right next to the donut is a fly undergoing a roll perturbation. I'm going to zoom up on it for you. Here's the gun shooting the donut. There's the fly. Here comes the blast wave from the gun. There goes the roll perturbation, just like I showed you in our experiments. And then the fly does what it does to correct for that perturbation. So I think the answer is unequivocally yes. At least in upstate New York, flies definitely experience these kinds of things in nature. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this corrective maneuver is that in none of this is the fly using its brain. The fly is doing all of these corrections with a neural circuit that's located on its back. And how do I know that? I know that from this video. So here's a video of a fly taking off, and it's able to control its flight no problem. So it can deal with all these mid-air perturbations. But the interesting thing about this video is that these flies have no head. Their head have been cut off. Aw, oh, come on. Did you hear yourself in the beginning? These heads have been cut off, and their necks have been cauterized, and yet they can still fly. How is it that they're able to do this? As Jim Truman says, <laughs> the head is overrated. These flies have something called a vibratory gyroscope on their back. All diptera used to have four wings. But the hind two wings became short and stubbly little things called haltiers. There they are. And this is what they look like when they're flapping. They go back and forth like little sticks. And when the fly rotates, they get left behind. And there are little nerves at the bottom of the haltiers on something called a campaniform that sense when the haltiers are being deflected. And then that information gets sent up through a neural circuit in the back of the fly to the steering muscles that are then controlling the wings. This next video is a showing you x-ray tomography data of those steering muscles. So what you're seeing here is a tomographic view of a fly's inside of its thorax. These cool muscles, and cool colored muscles, are four out of the 12 steering muscles that the fly uses in order to correct their flight. And one of these muscles in particular has been thought to be very important. It's called the basilar one muscle, the B1 muscle. And it's thought to be the one that controls how far forward the wings go, okay? which would be important for pitch. And so the amazing thing is that nowadays, we can go to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and we can essentially order flies where that individual neuron has been identified, and we can turn it off. That one neuron, we can turn it off. And that silences that one muscle. And then we can see whether or not any difference happens when we take that muscle out. So here we go. Here are the flies. This is the normal fly. It has a posture. We give it a perturbation. And it's able to correct its perturbation, its pitch orientation in time. If we take a look at the forward sweep of the wing, it's fit very well by our PI controller. Everything is as it was before. This is the B1 silenced fly. I've taken out this muscle. These flies start off quite wobbly to begin with. Then after we apply the perturbation, they are able to slow the perturbation down, but now they're wobbling about a different angle. They can no longer remember what angle they were originally flying with. And when we take a look at the controller, we can still fit the forward sweep of the wings. But now, we can only use a proportional controller. We took out the integral term. That one muscle controlled one branch of that control theory diagram. If you take it out, you take out that branch. Now, things aren't quite that simple. Here's a video of a fly undergoing a triple helix uh, quadruple flip with uh, rotation. <laughs> I think the first ever. 
And notice that this fly, nevertheless, is still able to correct itself within one, two, three wing beats. Now notice that it didn't turn back eight times in order to correct itself. And that means that that simple linear controller can't be the whole picture. There has to be something else governing that circuit. But it's a start. And nowadays, we can go and try to silence individual neurons in this control circuit that communicates between the vibratory gyroscopes on the back of the fly, all of the calculations happening in the ventral nervous cord of the fly, and the steering muscles that are affecting its flight. Now, one question you might ask is whether or not all this machinery is necessary. What happens if we just take out their gyroscopes? We can do that by gluing the halter to the fly. And when we do that, these animals can still flap, but they can no longer control their flight. And that's because any tiny little perturbation which requires these little adjustments, they can't measure them, and so they don't know how to adjust with their halteers. But if we somehow slowed the process down, maybe we could get some other organ to be able to tell what's going on. How do you do that? You take a dandelion seed, you crush it, you take some fibers from that seed, and you glue it to the butt of the fly. <laughs> the idea is that these feathers will slow the rotation down enough that some other organ will be able to tell what's going on. Does this work? It does. So here are flies that have had their halteres glued down, and yet they can still maintain their flight. In fact, there are animals that already use this strategy. This is the woolly aphid. You can find it here in Ithaca. And it has all of these tiny little hairs coming off its back. It doesn't need halteres to control its flight. So why develop halteres in the first place? Well, in the same way that an airline passenger jet is stable but not very maneuverable, these woolly aphids are stable, but they can't maneuver very fast. So if you lost those little tiny strings and you developed a, sense, a sensory organ like the halteer, you'd become much more maneuverable, and that would allow you to become a better predator, and it would allow you to also evade predation from other bigger animals. So let me leave you with this image of the simple fruit fly on top of the patent by the Wright brothers and point out that 350 million years ago, before insects take to the air, there are no trees. There are no flowers. All plants are less than three meters tall. So the ability of insects to take to the air and eventually control their flight has a massive impact on the ecology of this planet. This is Drosophila melanogaster. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> Thank you.